apart from each other, but we still find ourselves with being faced with the same issues that we find on a daily basis. And um, this has allowed us to be able to, to continue having conversations that um, in, in an unconventional way, and we've been able to reach a number of people that ordinarily wouldn't have been part of the conversations, as you say, and we've been able to, to reach into wider and bigger um, audiences that we would not have been able to have access to under normal circumstances. But And also looking at, at where we are today, here we are, we're all in different spaces, but we find ourselves also in one place. We have people also who are watching via um, Facebook. We have people that are gonna be watching via YouTube. We're all in different spaces, but we all are able to have conversations. And, and, and one of the things that also that I found quite intriguing and quite exciting is that these four IRs that we've been scared of for so long, we've now find ourselves having to be able to be part of. And this is how now we are able to have these conversations through um, you know, the, 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 the ability and as well as um, using that, the, the four IRs that we've all been scared of. And I'm going to quiet keep quiet now and I'm going to leave it to you all as experts to be able to carry this conversation forward. But um, I'm quite grateful and I'm looking forward to having today's conversation. Absolutely. So our guest of honor has joined us. Um, I'd just like to welcome everyone um, to today's conversation. As you have heard from Zaz, we have had conversations like these previously. And today we're just going to be putting focus on creativity in the digital age. And our discussion is going to be presented to us by Homozo Mauta. He is the owner and creative director at Design and Digital Agency Green Robot Design which opened its doors in 2007. He's also a regular contributor to Entrepreneur's Business section, Ask E, on their website, as well as for Standard Bank's BizConnect business portal, um, where he shares his top business tips with other entrepreneurs. Homoto, welcome, and we're looking forward to the conversation that you're going to be having with us. Thank you, Renata. How are you? Fantastic. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Can you hear me properly? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, thank you. Maybe let me not use my earphones. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for accommodating me and for the invite. I really do appreciate it. Um, and I sure. So, <laughs> where do we start? For I R. Um, can I? Can I share my screen? Yes, we would love to have you share your screen with us just so we follow um, your presentation. Give me two seconds. Okay. Um, I'd just like to um, let everyone that is streaming with us know that you're welcome to post your questions in um, the chat box. And when Komoto is done with his presentation, um, just as we get into conversation with him, then I will pose your questions to him. And we can have a conversation surrounding creativity in the digital age and every other thing that he's going to discuss with us today. So if you have questions, you're welcome to send them through. And as he continues to present, you can start posting your questions in the chat box as well. So as we have said, we're going to be discussing creativity in the digital age. Moto just has a presentation that he has put together for us, which he is um, trying to put up right now. And then we can get started. Are you succeeding, Komoto? Komoto? Any luck with the presentation? Uh, okay. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Okay, I think um, yeah, I think uh, to set up 
the presentation for us. But if there's anyone that um, knows of the fourth industrial revolution, it's a time that we're currently finding ourselves in at the moment. And a lot of us are finding ourselves questioning what this means for us, especially in the you know, jobs that we're finding ourselves in, the career paths that we're finding ourselves in. And especially now during this time of um, this pandemic that we're facing, finding ourselves in lockdown and finding the need to adapt to these changes. I think this is a conversation that is going to help us, you know, find ways to adapt, find ways to create, find ways to better interact with the space that we're finding ourselves in. Um, the University of Johannesburg is actually finding itself as a leader in the fourth industrial revolution. And we're quite honored to have speakers that are well-versed in this field to tell us more about the fourth industrial revolution and also help us that might not even understand this completely um, navigate our way around the fourth industrial revolution. So Komoto, you can just give me the heads up once you have managed to fix your presentation so that we can get going with today's discussion. All right, um, I think he's still trying to fix that as well. But let's try to talk about um, the fourth industrial revolution and what it means to us in our respective fields. I'm finding myself in the media space. Um, I work on air as a radio personality, but I also work as a voiceover artist. I sometimes have to um, attend auditions, but now it's somewhat become impossible with the work that I'm doing. So. I found that this, this, this space has actually allowed me to do a whole lot more work than I actually was able to do while I was actually still working um, because um, now there's more time to actually get things done. So with radio, unfortunately, we haven't been able to be on air because the university is currently closed. So we're just waiting on that. But apart from that, we have these live sessions that we are having with the University of Johannesburg's library. And I've also found myself needing to build my own studio to record my voiceovers that are needed by clients. I have now set up my mic and a studio, recording that, then sending it via email to clients as well, which is now a new adaptation of that kind of work because I'd usually have to go into studio, record and leave. But now the studio has now come to me and I've had to create that space for myself as well. And with auditions for TV gigs that I find myself needing to grab my hands on, I found that I've needed to record my auditions in my home as well. So the drive of having to go to studios and audition has changed for me. I found myself recording in house. I find myself, you know, doing most of my work remotely, which I feel is a blessing and has allowed me to do a whole lot more. Um, for you, Zaz, how have you found yourself needing to adapt to the changes that um, think, we have now found ourselves forced to, 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 to be in or be with. Thank you, thank you for that. I think for us as well, it, it's been quite critical for us to, to, to be able to prove how agile are we in the business that we find or the spaces mm -hmm. that we find ourselves in. Um, as a result, we are in the eventing space. And what we do is that one, one part of our business, it is to ensure that we, we, we organize um, conventions, summits, conferences and the like. And, and because that we are now unable to have a certain number of people seated in one place due to, to the lockdown and social distancing, we had to now find ways and means to be able to still be able to do that, but without um, risking or putting other people at risk. Mm. You know? And as a result, we had now come up with ways and different ways of having the same thing that we would have, but also find to, to find um, solutions in bringing events on to different digital spaces. As a result, on daily basis, every day at, at six o'clock, we now have digital, digital conversations on our platform. That will be on Facebook, that will be YouTube, that will be on Twitter. And um, that has allowed people also to be able to partake in those conversations um, on a daily basis. And not only that, but it has also allowed our speakers 
to be able to do more gigs than one. For example, because we are, we are a talent firm as well, and uh, what we then do is that we would have, if you're booking my speaker, for example, and you are based in Johannesburg, if I have another gig in, 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 in Durban, if there are maybe an hour or two hours later, then that would mean that speaker would not be able to make it. But now with the digital conversations, with the 4IR, we found that, that has been, we have been able to do that. You would find the speaker being able to deliver a keynote in Johannesburg maybe mm -hmm. for an hour and then get time to rest and change and then get into a different outfit and then be able to still deliver a keynote for yeah. an audience that is sitting in, in Durban and then still be able to change and deliver another keynote for, for an audience that is sitting now in, in, in Cape Town all in one day which is something that if anybody would have been able to say to me a year ago or six months ago would i be able to do that my answer would have been a resounding no i will not be able to do that because mm -hmm. i would need to be able to, to 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 be able to bring my speaker to you for them to be able to do that so it, it has been quite a blessing in disguise in a sense that we have been able to to do more with less and at the same time, we have been able to explore avenues that we ordinarily wouldn't have been able to explore. And, mm -hmm. and also, some of the speakers, they come back and they say to us, you know what, this has been quite amazing because I know that for me to be able to get to an event, I would have had to leave my family, leave my children, and drive to whatever particular place that you would need me to deliver a keynote at or where you would need me to be able to, to do a certain function at but now i'm able to do that in the comfort of my own home and because most of them some some of them are actually are, are, are parents and they parenting kids and with the kids being at home they're able to say you know what i'm able to do my work within an hour and once i'm done with yeah. that i still carry on and be able to to carry on with the kids at home and and homeschool my children at home and so those are the things that have been brought about yeah. by by yeah. this four ir and as well as this pandemic that we find ourselves in. But with that being said, also, it has been quite an interesting ride, an interesting journey. We didn't just jump into it. It was also um, a trial and error, you know, uh, process where we had to eventually settle into, into something that works for us. And it's been an interesting, an interesting one for us quite a lot. So we've been able to find different aspects of, of the business and be able to also change how the business model has been before because previously we would have said we would be able to organize your event you know at a specific time or whatever and whatever the case might be if we say you don't have a venue then we wouldn't have been able to but now we find ourselves being able to say we can even be able to bring you your event in your in any platform that you have if you have people sitting on zoom and you have people sitting on an ms office and you have people sitting on any platform we are able to bring them together at the same time and still be able to stream that live on facebook and still be able to stream that live on youtube and be able to stream that live on any of the platforms where you find most of the people seated at so this has really allowed us to be able to do to do um, business differently just as you're saying that for you it has been that yeah, absolutely. But we can't ignore the fact that there are some industries that have struggled to adapt. And I think our conversation for today is going to help um, people of such industries understand how they can be more creative in their spaces. And I think um, Homozo is going to help us unpack that. Homozo, are you ready for us now? I am. I'm, I do apologize. I do apologize for my technical difficulties. Is everyone uh, there? Yes, we are can ready. Can you hear me properly? Sure. Okay, um, I think we're having a bit of problems with just the presentation. I'm not sure if you might have it on your side, Bulela, if you could possibly share your screen with me. All right, let me try to do that. Um... Yeah. Okay, let's see. Uh, I think in the interim, let me sort of, let me carry on from, and then we'll pick up the presentation as you find it. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the invite from UJ Library. I do appreciate it. Um, uh, my name is Komoto Mauta. Um, I'm the creative director of uh, Green Robot Design. 
um, we're a traditional um, graphic design and, and creative agency. Um, and I think since the inception of the company, we've had to, oh, there we go. Um, we've had to sort of pivot and especially now in times of, of, of COVID and the situation that we do find ourselves in, uh, we have had to pivot the company and try and understand where we are going and what this sort of uh, landscape looks like. Um, and just to sort of delve into what our, into our conversation today, which is 4IR. So I think we've, there's different um, sayings and interpretations of what that is, but loosely put, um, 4IR is, is the revolution, is the, the revolution of the 19th century, um, following sort of the steam, steam revolution, electricity and, and the computing space. Um, and now we find that 4 hours is almost a way of life, how we work, how we interact with people. If you look at what we're doing now with the Zoom conversation and, and, and the webinars, you'll find that this is where we are and how we are interacting with a lot of people in the digital space and the IoT of things. Um, and we find that 4 hours is fueled mainly or fueled primarily by IoT, which is the internet of things, how we communicate with machines, how we communicate with our phone, data um, data and and other other collateral um, and I thought maybe let me also just look into what creativity is and what creativity means and I'll uh, can you skip me sorry about that um, what is creativity and I find like creativity is such a and how do you explain that how do you explain what creativity is? And for me, it's, um, it's how we think, how we work. And I think a lot of people find or want to or rather interpret creativity as art or as um, design or as website development or more the creative space where people see or interact with uh, visual comms. And I think creativity is more broader than that. I think there's a lot more uh, that goes into in creativity where it's innovation it's it's the evolution of how we we make and create things um, um, on a broader scale and i was reading an article recently uh, which said this creativity is the ability to transcend tra traditional ways of thinking or acting and to develop um, original ideas and methods and this kind of encompassed like what creativity is for me um, you and, and it's in its ability um, you'll find that it's uh, can you, sorry, sorry, can you skip Lela? Unless I go up, down, so, right. Yeah, I'm just going to sort of read through, I do apologize, I'm going to read through sure. um, part, part of the presentation. It's an ability. Um, it's also an ability to run a mile or to do calculus uh, or recite a Shakespeare sonnet. Um, so creativity is a skill that is specific to an individual or some people. It might seem to come naturally, but it's, but it's something that anyone can improve on at any given time with time and effort. And you'll find that we're all creative. It's not necessarily the people that who used to do art at school or the guys who are musicians or the guys who are uh, performing arts. I think we are all innate, so in, in some way innately creative. Um, and we find that we are so streamlined or we are so um, closed minded, sorry, uh, yeah, closed minded to some extent in, in the way that we think and how we're taught that people feel that if I'm not an artist, if I'm not someone who draws or paints that I'm not creative and you find, and that isn't the, the case really. I think everyone in their own right is able to be a creative, how to innovate or to create, um, oh, to create innovations in different spaces and in different industries. Um, and it transcends through time. I think for us to find ourselves where we are right now, we needed a lot of what we would think um, is scientists and mathematicians, but all of these people created um, innovations or innovative ideas that we are now using in our sort of day-to-day -day life. So we find that we are moving in sort of spaces and time where we are constantly evolving and innovating in different spaces. So it's not something that is stagnant, and that's how we perceive and see creativity. Um, and I guess just innovation. For us to be where we are right now, we find that we need to innovate and constantly evolve and to change what is happening within our lives now. You know, so um, you find that 
and I'll use this example later on in, 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 in the discussion is the phone, for instance. We used to have phones that were um, keypad driven. Uh, we used to type um, pressing like numbers and numeric text and so forth. And now you find that we are now in a space where it's touch screens, et cetera. You know? So we are finding ourselves very developed and evolving over time. And where to, where are we and where are we, where are we from, where are we, <clears throat> where are we now and where are we going? And I think this would be the basis of my conversation with everyone today. Um, <clears throat> cool. Um, so I wanted to sort of give context by going back a little bit um, into where we're from. And I am traditionally a graphic designer um, who uses a computer, who is um, skilled in the set that I draw and illustrate and so forth. And I use my dad as a comparison because of where he's from. And my dad was a graphic designer for the SAPC um, in, call it the 80s and so forth. And what he used to do is he used to draw. So all the things that you'd see on TV and broadcast would be something that he'd need to draw from scratch. So creating mm. a logo, creating um, concepts, creating stage design and so forth. And what you find now in, in our day and age is something that took him a week is something that I could do in a day because of where we've transitioned. And this is where computing and technology has brought us uh, over the, call it the past sort of 20 years and so forth. Um, and what we were finding is that, so things like letter sets. So like a letter set is something that you would need to physically apply onto a um, piece of material, or if it was a can, if it was a poster and so forth. And what we're doing now is vastly different. Well, not vastly different, but has transcended over time because of the advancement of technology. Um, and, and now we find ourselves being able to do all of these assets in sort of two, three minutes. And this is sort of the evolution of creativity um, within the space because of the evolution of time and what for R and IoT has brought to us. So the evolution of the computer is primarily the biggest thing. And us as creatives have become more and more um, involved with creating um, artwork, uh, designs, um, pieces of advertising for uh, our clients because of this. I don't think we would be where we are right now if it wasn't for the evolution of the computing system and where that has brought us now. <laughs> you can, sorry, you can skip that, sorry. All right, cool. I just wanna come in there um, just with a question based on um, the evolution of creativity and how you know things were back then and how they are now. You know, with um, creativity back then, we were actually forced to, you know, really, really use our mind and to full capacity, one could say. But now we're finding that with the movement of um, technology and computers, um, you know, coming into play, we are somewhat limiting our creativity. Do you think that this is an actual thing or we are just struggling to think beyond what is presented before us? Look, I think that we find ourselves, um and I'm sort of stuck in two, two minds with this, is that we find ourselves being more and more dependent on uh, what computers can do for us. And I think at the same time, what we should be doing is because we are the creators and we are the people who are inputting information into computers to create design, is that we should be leading the conversation or leading where this should be going. Uh, and we, if, you, if, if you see, or if you sort of look at some of the studies, you'll find that the creative space is um, or the creative jobs rather are going to be more high in demand because a computer can't paint, a computer can't take mm -hmm. beautiful pictures, a, mm -hmm. a computer can't write a sonnet, you know what I mean? So all of those things go hand in hand with how we input information. AI can only do so much. And the more that we put input data into that is the more that it will sort of spit back or bring back or create things that we think are, are computed, you know what I mean? So I think for, <clears throat> excuse me, I think for a big part is how do we, especially in the creative space, I think some jobs will, <clears throat> excuse me, I think some jobs will obviously over time be redundant. So the sort of the low, the low stream jobs, the sort of um, hard and laborious jobs, like picking up uh, 
machines picking up or assembling cars and that type of stuff is going to be computed and AI is going to help um, and robotics is going to help a lot in that. But in terms of the creative space, there's only so much that computers can actually do. Okay, so we won't get to a point where uh, computers have just taken, you know, certain individuals' minds, reprogrammed them to, to, to create a system that will be put in um, robots or in um, this, this artificial intelligence that is being created to then form a new type of um, creativity or creative space. I don't think so. Uh, maybe, in, maybe call it another five or 10 years time, maybe. Um, okay. But I think at the moment, there's only so much that, it, that, that computing and robotics can do and AI. You know, there was um, an article I was reading um, mid last year where um, a system had now created um, a soundtrack to a movie. And because of what and the input and the data that we've put into it, created uh, emotive music that would help sort of play the movie along. And I think because those things are possible, but we need to understand what and how the emotion would be for that particular movie. So we still need to lead that sort of conversation or lead that data input into those things. And that will never be a sort of generated from scratch by a machine, put together, create the sound and so forth. We are still very much in control, especially within the creative realm. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So let's then get into where we are now and what things um, are looking like for us. Yeah, so I think, look, where we are now, um, there's a lot of stuff. And I find myself uh, being in the space, learning every day, learning more, understanding a lot more, understanding what the interaction with people and consumers are. Um, and we're in a very, I think a very cool space. Um, a very open-minded space where there's a lot that we should be and could be doing. Uh, but I think a lot of us are still afraid of taking on and understanding what this could mean for us. You know, so a lot of people are like, oh no, um, IoT or FireR has come with uh, the loss of jobs and so forth. But what we then need to understand is that once the laborers tasks of sitting in a factory are taken over by that, that gives us more time for us to do other things and to actually be humans, you know? I think right now um, we're in a space where uh, augmented reality, VR, virtual reality is a thing that makes our lives a lot easier. You know, I was uh, earlier on during the, the lockdown was sitting at home and I, with my VR headset and I was able to sort of I logged onto YouTube, was able to go to a Paris, which I wouldn't have been able to go to right now, but I was in Paris with my VR set. So it exposes us to uh, places, uh, ideas, how things function, and that type of stuff is stuff that will, would sometimes not be normally accessible to um, some people. But because of technology, that allows us to now escape um, learn more things, learn new and better things, things in America, things in China that we wouldn't normally be able to. And that's, I guess, the transition of, of, of um, creativity and how we use this, you know? Mm. I think also like uh, I, find, I found, or I find that during the, 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 the lockdown period, a lot of people have now been pushed into the space you know, a lot of people, when we were talking about this and we were trying to pitch to, to clients and so forth, call it two, three years ago, um, people didn't understand and understand the benefit of, of creating or working digitally, how, um, how we can better um, experiences for people, even though there's sometimes not a human touch or uh, a human element to it, there's so much more that we can do that can make our lives easier. But now we've sort of accelerated so much right now because of what is happening with COVID and so forth that we're now forced to, to get into, into this realm that we, we weren't ready for. And that's the biggest thing now is that how do we catch up? I think especially as South Africa, we're sitting at a point where we're having to catch up more than we are leading the conversation or even getting people to interact or engage with um, variant um, um, solutions and products and so forth. Mm. You know, earlier on before um, you started with your presentation, there was a comment that um, made mention of the fact that, you know, a lot of other industries aren't able to adapt to the situation that we're finding ourselves in now. And in such in instances like that, where do you feel then 
creativity fits into that? Or how then do we then, you know, put our creativity into the spaces that are somewhat struggling to adapt to this, this time and period that we're finding ourselves in? Look, I think, uh, understand you so, like, I think there's a lot of people, there's, and there's a lot of businesses that are going to sort of be deemed redundant. Um, and that's because that is evolution. I don't think the guy who is m sort of assembling something and during the steam um, revolution is, is, is someone who's still very relevant now. And, and we just need to sort of accept that. But because of that, there, there are new jobs that are coming into the industry and some jobs more than, more than anything are expanding. So you'll find like in the creative space, we're finding that, like I was saying, we're not looking at people who are going to design from, well, no create music from scratch which is going to use machines that are going to help us do that but that lends us or gives us more time to start doing a lot more other things and experimenting in in things that would be a lot um a lot more time staking you know so i think we need to see this point in time as a place or a time that we are able to um explore more than yeah. anything i think we're, it's time for us to explore ourselves as humans to explore what the possibilities are in our different um, uh, industries. So whether it be design, what could we be doing better? What could we be looking back into, you know? And I think with that comes more, um, uh, not necessarily responsibility, but it becomes more ideation. How do we now create the next best thing, you know? And I, I was looking at, at Pinterest, for instance. So you look at Pinterest and I was reading um, or watching an article you find that Pinterest puts all these ideas together, hypothetically. Um, yeah. they, they put these ideas together, you do a search and it's, it puts all the boards together. But the person who put those boards together was a human, you know? So all of those things are things that don't um, necessarily are computed, but we need to have some sort of input. So we need to understand and open our minds to saying, okay, look, we are evolving. There is stuff that is changing over time, but how do we still get involved and play a part in the evolution and how how we move through the the, the four IR phase. Mm. There's a there's quite an interesting point that came through from thanks well Bulelani, and he was saying you know they, he appreciates you for your time and sharing your insightful wisdom. But how do you see the fourth industrial revolution narrative applied within our informal traders? who are leveraged by the mainstream setting. So such as the ordinary lady who sells veggies somewhere in the CBD or a local man who sells brooms by foot. What do you think is the plan for such people as we look forward to adapting to this new age? I think a big part uh, lies in governance. Um, I think a big part of it is understanding uh, what this means for us. Like I was saying, a lot of people are very scared of the changes that are about to happen. But I think hand in hand, sitting with people like creatives, people who are scientists and mathematicians, et cetera, and understanding what our five-year and our 10-year sort of um, timeline looks like, we need to sit and say, okay, how do we um, get these people still involved? How do we get them to uh, not necessarily expand, but for them to not be deemed redundant you know what I mean so do we upskill them do we teach them a lot more I think like I was like I was saying there's stuff that we aren't going to be able to avoid like there are coffee makers and being well yeah coffee makers that serve people like in San Francisco there's coffee makers and and, and coffee shops that serve people without any people being physically in the store Amazon goes the same where you get into the shop, you buy your stuff, you don't need to interact with anyone or a teller and so forth. So we do need to accept that things are going to change, but I think we need to also sit with people like people in government and sort of the private sector also to say, okay, how do we also, besides uh, people losing jobs, how do we then upskill these people to then either get into different industries or get into the same industry, but with a lot more knowledge and a lot more understanding of what they play and what their role plays. You know, I think a lot of people, like I was saying, they just feel that, okay, our jobs are done. We're not going to be working. We don't have a space in this time, you know, and I think that's not necessarily the case. It's just about how do we um, innovate? How do we uh, create? How do we uh, expand and, and, and see where the opportunity is? Because I think if we looked at like the 1800s, the 1700s, most of the jobs that are now 
here right now is jobs that people wouldn't have thought of in call it a hundred years ago, you know, and I think in the same way, whatever jobs are here now, part of them won't be here in sort of 10 years time, but there'll be more jobs and newer jobs that we really don't know right now, you know? Yeah. So moving back then into your presentation, before we get into the other questions, uh, maybe this part of your presentation would then help answer some of the questions that we have. Where then does creativity find life in the fourth industrial revolution? I think for me, and, and because we're in a part, we're in a, a stage where we're, I guess, on the brink of everything. We don't understand fully where we're going. We can sort of guess where we're going with some of the things. Mm -hmm. But I think a big part of, of where we're going is understanding um, understanding the, the landscape um, where our creativity is at the forefront of what automation would be, you know? So how do we create ideas ideation, create something and let the computer sort of finish it off because there's nothing that beats the human mind. You know, mm -hmm. um, like I was saying, there's like the sonnets, like the music, like the logos, those things aren't computed. Those things are either emotive. Um, and this is why I've got this um, equation here, the, the cultural intelligence, the IQ, the emotional intelligence. And those are things that computers and robots don't have. And this mm -hmm. is where we should play the sort of role and the center of how everything plays around us. You know, I think there's IoT, yes, the, inter the internet of things, but what is our role and where do we sit in the center of everything that will then let everything evolve around us, you know? Mm. So I don't think that we should sit back and say that, okay, now it's over. We need to be like, okay, what is the potential? Where can we go? What else can we do? What can, can we innovate on? What ideas can we come up with that will help better ourselves, better ourselves as humans, as a human race, and more so help people? And I think that's where our conversation should be going, is that there's a lot of stuff that uh, is human focused, sort of like the CQ, the cultural element is, is, is human focused. How do we better that over time without thinking that we become redundant? Yeah. So um, we also have a question coming through from Aidan saying it's fascinating and it actually raises the question of how education systems are going to be evolving. And this is something that a lot of people have actually um, had questions um, regarding. So they, he would love to know how you came to this conclusion, the self-taught to adapt, or did you learn from educational platforms? Because they feel our educational system is so outdated and would really love to hear your thoughts on this i think and i was i was fortunate enough to have this discussion on a panel sort of last year um we had gone to um uh, to india to discover and to understand how they do business and so forth and what i was saying in the in the panel discussion is that my my biggest issue with let's call it uh tertiary education at the moment um is that we find ourselves in a point where we're learning what is currently happening now, whereas we should be learning what's going to be happening. Uh, and because of that, we find that uh, sometimes there's sort of like a lot of job, job unemployment, et cetera, et cetera, because people are put into an industry that is already three years evolved. So if you're in varsity now, what you're going to get in 2023 is going to be redundant because you you're only learning about it um yeah you're only learning about it at the end of 2023 whereas the industry that you're about to or wanted to get into has now moved um three years on you know and if i was listening to the to the other speaker um i think last week and he was saying that the the internet life cycle or yearly cycle is like 10 weeks you know so how many things have evolved and happened over a period of three years for you to then finish and get your degree and then you get into the industry and it's now you're three years behind already you know so uh, the traditional sense of 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 um education um i think obviously needs to change to some extent um and i see a lot of schools are doing that um where they've got either computer computer learning uh, they've got 3d <laughs> printers uh, some schools obviously like now have been sort of zooming 
um, with lectures uh, and so forth. And I think for me personally, um, I was or I am um, varsity dropout. And so I learned a lot of my trade on YouTube in what, call it 20, 2003, 2004. I learned a lot of that of design, of web development and so forth on the internet. And I think for sort of fast forward 14 years later, that space has been a space where you can get a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, insights, a lot of experts that you wouldn't normally interact with. So like if you're sitting in your, in your, in your lecture, lecture, in your lectures at school, it's not the same as sitting with the head of Ogilvy, who's giving a talk or understanding on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? So I think we need to sort of find the balance in between the two, between um, traditional sort of um, going to class, uh, socialization, etc. But there also needs to be a big, a bigger element where we're learning a lot more stuff online, digitally, and so forth. Yeah, I think which will also save us um, a whole lot more time and effort. Because I think finding ourselves in this this pandemic that we're in has forced a lot of us to actually find creative ways, ways. of actually you know getting the work or the job done in yes. this space. And you know, some people have found themselves creating platforms that accommodate the fields that they are in. Um, I've also got a question coming through from Mohaila. Mohaila says, would he be correct to say in the long run, it won't be about talent anymore. It would be about machine power one can acquire. Personally, he's seen guys learning stuff and adopting new skills from YouTube videos and influx of photographers cause then people can buy the coolest gear to assist them. And is it really going to be about talent anymore or learning a certain software and understanding the algorithms to do creative work? This is a brilliant question because you find that a lot of people are now finding themselves, you know, getting into industries just because they've learned stuff on YouTube and it's not um, stuff that they, they, they traditionally acquired or qualifications that they traditionally acquired. Do you then really feel that it will still be about talent or just because I've acquired this knowledge on the internet, um, I am, you know, capable enough to get the job done or is it going to be about the algorithms to do their creative work? Look, I think yeah, sort of half and half. But I think more so creativity is creativity. Being uh, talented at drawing will always be there. Uh, and, and you'll find that there's a lot of people who are talented in, in their different spheres. It won't take away anything. If anything, it's just going to make uh, the playing field a lot more competitive. And that's what we need, because that's what's going to push us to think better, to think differently, to sort of think out the box. And because of either having a good camera or not having a good camera doesn't take away the fact of having a really good eye. You know what I mean? A, a computer's not sitting there and saying, okay, if I catch it at sunrise or sunset at this reflection, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to give me a perfect picture. You know, so I think those things are things that only the human can do. And because of, like I was saying, the EQ, the emotional intelligence of understanding what this emotion creates, that will never happen with computers. You know what I mean, maybe not now, but it, it's, it's, it might happen, but it might not happen uh, as quick as we thought because we need to input so much data into all of this, you know? So I think, yes, uh, there is a point where um, a lot more industries will be um, saturated, but at the same time, this is what we need. We need to create a lot more competition for us to start be more critical in our thinking, to be better in our thinking, uh, to connect with people because of all the computing that's happening, we're not interacting like we used to. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We're Zooming, we're Skyping, we're WhatsApping, we're house partying. Uh, and, and because of that, we need to get a lot more um, tangible emotion in the things that we do. You know what I mean? Do you find that we might face losing that tangible emotion or that physical interaction because we would then become comfortable in this new space that we're finding ourselves in. Like you said, we've got your house parties, we've got different things that are taking place online, which has now made us somewhat comfortable and relaxed in the spaces that we're finding ourselves in. Right now, we don't want to go out and socialize because we've got social media to do that for us. You know, we're yeah. chatting to people and um, we speak whatever we want on social media, so much so that we actually feel that that's a much better interaction action than actually being physically there mm -hmm. look i and i was speaking to a friend yesterday um she she we were just having a general discussion and she was saying to me during the sort of the the covid and the lockdown that she's sort of lost her job but what she said to me was what 
I think sort of sparked the ideas that I was thinking about is that she's now found time to do the things that she wants because she was stuck in a job where she was sitting, she was doing this, 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 and it was a creative space, but she's found that she's able to now pursue her passion projects, which are more fulfilling to uh, expand or explore my ideas that she's always had over the past years. So I think we need to also direct that narrative and how we want our lives to lead, you know? So as much as there's a house party, there's, there's a Facebook live, there's just whatever they might be, we need to still be humans. All we're saying is that, yes, there's automation. Yes, there's access to a video call right there. And then that should be a, my friend is in Cape Town. But if your friend is in Pretoria, let me go and see my friend because this is where we will now sort of, um, to some extent sort of taking it back and saying, okay, how do we interact as humans? How do we be humans again? Because everything has been um, taken over by robotics and, and AI and so forth. Let's now let that part of life happen, but let's also still be humans. If I can come to your house with a self-driven car, it's not as big of a task for me to now have to drive and I can now get to you quicker, sooner, safer without maybe getting into an accident but now I can see you more often. You know what I mean? I can drive down to Durban if I'm in an automated car. That type of thinking, you know? So I think we need to look at um, the evolution as something that's going to take away a lot of the things that we didn't want to do, but we can now do all the things that we never had time to do. You know, you're sitting at home now, uh, forced to sort of um, work through work because of like, deadlines and through Zoom meetings and so forth, but you're sitting at home and you've got more time than you expected. Now you're doing the garden. Now you're spending more time with your mom, your dad, having those conversations that are human conversations that you can't have with the computer. You know mm. what I mean? So I think we need to also see the other side of, 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 well, yeah, the other side of the fence and be like, okay, what can we do as humans to still be humans, you know, yeah. without letting technology take, take us over? Yeah, sticking to, to that conversation surrounding, you know, what we can do as humans without having technology take over. I have Quentin here with a question that says, um, there is no doubt that artificial intelligence and social media make life easier. Yes. However, what ethical implications does the fourth industrial revolution have on your everyday life? Um, sure. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I will, again, with a lot of reading, I was reading again about uh, a software that the, um, one of Elon Musk's um, companies has created, and it's it's data driven. So it's it's taking so much data from different sources, different platforms, servers, etc. Uh, but now they found that it's a bit they're wary to let sort of or to to open up this this software to to the to the broader market because of the implications that it might cause in terms of the reality in terms of good sources good information reliable information and sources versus what things get picked up on the internet uh, that wouldn't necessarily be true so we're looking at now how many fake news sites they are how many fake news is being put out there and so forth and if you take all of that and then you get something to compute it and then sort of process it and say it's it's real life then we're sitting in a world where we blurred the lines so much that we can't we don't understand what's what you know what i mean so i think that there's a lot like i was saying there's a lot more um governance that needs to come into the space on how and what these machines and these softwares uh, can do and can't do, restricted to do, for us to still have some sort of normalcy in terms of our everyday lives. You know what I mean? I don't know if I sort of answered that well enough. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it kind of makes sense. Um, we are running out of time and I just want to get Troy's question in as well. And then I will um, we'll close up with just a question that I have that I think will, will, will give room for everyone to start thinking about what they should do to adapt to the space. But Troy wants to understand, or while well, he says he understands that 4IR is not new and we are relatively behind already according to some professors. So how do things like the negative reports or news on the effects of 5G further set us back in the revolution and how best can we get the correct information to the public to understand that we need to be part of this revolution um so i think there's there's a lot that and 
I think there's a lot that government needs to play in this space, you know, um, in terms of just disseminating information, um, showing us the way. And because we voted for the people who are in power and to understand that the government is the people who are supposed to lead us, they need to sort of lead this conversation and lead this discussion. Yes, we are far behind. I think we're totally far behind. We're not going to see a lot of things until like five, 10 years time. You know, I was, I was speaking to another friend in Dubai who was telling me that there's automated banking, there's drive-through banking, there's access points in airports where it's scanning who you are, scanning your iris, scanning your fingerprints, so there's no more human interaction. And I don't think we'll see that right now, you know? And I think we need to be sitting or maybe even, um, uh, proposing to government and fighting back and saying, guys, why are we here? Like, why are we still so far behind, you know? And I think that obviously leads into the conversation about 5G and getting the necessary infrastructure to, for us to evolve. You know, I think there's a lot of people who aren't going to see the things that um, other people have seen in terms of people who have traveled, people who are well learning, people on the internet half the time and so forth. Um, yes, I think there's a big part of, of this like I guess people being very skeptical about 5G because of the fake news, um, what is true and what isn't true. But I think we need to then sort of unblur those gray lines, unblur those, um, uh, those or well, unblur the gray lines and, and get people to understand what is this 5G and other technology and what is the benefit of it. You know what I mean? I think everyone's always afraid of what they don't know until they see the benefit of what this could be, you know, and I think a big part sits in some of our government institutions to say, okay, guys, this is what we're doing. This is the betterment of, of society that's going to happen because of this uh, and so forth. So just to, just to wrap up, look, I mean, this, this conversation surrounding the fourth industrial revolution is one that can go on forever, but until we actually immerse ourselves in the actual revolution and try to find ways to evolve, um, then we'll forever have, have questions with, without getting the answers. But for people that are finding themselves in industries that are still struggling to adapt or finding themselves in industries that don't exactly understand the full concept of the fourth industrial revolution, or people that are finding themselves without jobs, especially in this time, and now when we get out of this, we might find ourselves you know, having to ad adapt more into the digital space. What kind of skills do you feel people need to start looking at or you know, strengthening or honing um, in order to be able to form part of this revolution that we call the fourth industrial revolution? I think there's, there's a Forbes study that I'd read about like the sort of five sort of top tier um, industries. Um, one was the medical industry. Um, in terms of sort of creating uh, medicine uh, for different illnesses and illnesses, etc. Um, the creative industry is a big part of that. Um, how do we still engage with people who are in that space, filmmakers, um, filmmakers, musicians, graphic designers, etc. Because those people create things that like I was saying, computers wouldn't be able to create. Um, science is a big field also um, because of what it is. I think we have, wouldn't have advanced to where we are as a human race if it wasn't for science and, and technology, but more science than anything. Um, there was one more. Um, sure, I forgot the last one. There's another one. Uh, oh, yes development IT. So the people who are writing the programs for these computers that are going to take over our lives are people who have developed sort of the programming, the language and so forth. So getting into those industries or getting into those uh, professions is going to help quite a lot uh, because once we get into those spaces, there's more opportunity. And because like I was saying, if there's more competition in those spaces, is there more that will sort of fast track and get more people involved uh, in terms of getting, or rather lessening the job employment, unemployment um, ratio, but also being able to uh, get people to work and still have jobs in, that, in those spaces. But there's, I think there's a, there's a lot more, I think there's about 10 in that, in that research doc, but those were the sort of top four that um, people should be looking into. Mm. 
So we're, we're trying to understand the space. Information is available to us, but sometimes we don't find credible information, especially, especially pertaining to the fourth industrial revolution. Just as um, Troy has said, you know, the information surrounding 5G, we don't know what the actual What's, truth around it is, you know? Yeah. Which platforms then would be best for us to actually take a look at that will better enhance our knowledge relating to 4IR? Um, so I, I, I read a lot, a lot of stuff online, um, which sometimes is credible, sometimes not. Um, but I think with everything that you, you take on, you sort of, uh, for me, a lot of reports. Uh, so things like how the Harvard report, um, Forbes helps quite a lot. Uh, but I think if you can get to an understanding where you know what the basis of the conversation is, so like, 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 you said before, like the conversation of 4IR has happened and started, call it four, five, six years ago. And we know what the basis of that is. And we understand the elements and the ethics and the ethos of what we're building onto is to say, if I read this and I read that, what kind of makes sense? You know, I think sometimes we can sit and say, okay, it's like this doesn't really make sense. This kind of leans to what I understand as the root of of everything, you know. So um, yeah, I read a lot more, I read a lot more reports and, and articles, and I get a lot of information from online. So I think it's just sitting and sort of going through references and websites that kind of make sense. Places like TechCrunch, Amazon, and so forth are the places that I get the most information, and just sort of uh, university reports because that's where a lot of this work is coming from. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Komuto, we have unfortunately run out of time, but um, I would like to thank you for taking time to come and share your knowledge with us and, you know, further informing us of how we can actually get creative in the space that we're finding ourselves in. And I certainly hope that um, those that have joined us in today's meeting have taken a lot from it. And um, we thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Bilala, and thank you to you, Jay Library, for giving me the opportunity um, to share my thoughts. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic. So I'll pass on to Zaz, who will close off um, our meeting for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bilala. This was quite an interesting conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I think it is the more we have in these conversations, as far as 4IR is concerned, as far as 5G is concerned, there's more, the, the more we get an understanding and then we get the knowledge that we need. Um, and because there's really quite a lot that we read about out there that is true and some of it is not true. And it, it gives us an opportunity for us to be able to make up our own minds as to what really is relevant, what is working, what is not working. And, um, and, and thank you also for, for bringing this to us. Also. Now we, we understand, you know, if it's something else to, to, to know that there is 4IR, but also to know exactly how it impacts one's life in different spheres and in different, different streams. You've been able to do that for us as far as the creative industry is concerned. And we want to thank you so much for that. And to everybody else that has been able to join us today, thank you so much for, for being with us. And we hope and believe that you're going to come and join us again next week. Um, we're having quite a fully, fully, fully power-packed um, uh, program for next week. Please do join us when you, when you have time. Um, we're going to be advertising a lot of those on, um, on uh, UJ Library website uh, page. On Facebook, you can tell that I'm an old person, right? <laughs> <laughs> Websites. <laughs> Website, yeah. That's, that's how we used to refer to things. You see, but we are evolving and we're transitioning and we're growing as well. And mm -hmm. um, and this is, has been quite very, very educational and we really, really appreciate it. And and thank you so much and for availing yourself and, 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 and giving us your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much. Awesome stuff. We hope to see everyone in the next discussion. We wish you... A very productive day moving forward and we will see you next week.